Okay, so the number of attendees is levelling out. So, Adam, if you'd like to take us away. Thank you very much, Ian. It's our great pleasure to welcome you to this introduction to mediation and other forms of dispute resolution. Some say alternative dispute resolution, others say uh, appropriate dispute resolution. But we really appreciate that you are sacrificing 30 minutes on a beautiful day, so we'll try and keep to time. Some introductions. Ian Kane, who you've just seen on your screen, is a sought-after member of Goldsmith Chambers. His practice is mixed common law, and he's had an academic interest in the study of ADR. He's also an accredited mediator with ADR Group. And for those who have followed this Goldsmith Chambers series of webinars, Ian Kane is a regular webinar presenter, so I'm privileged to be sharing this platform with him. And if anything goes wrong, uh, I will, of course, blame Ian. Uh, my, as, <laughs> no as change ever, there, Adam. <laughs> no change. Uh, my practice is complex crime, fraud, and business disputes. Uh, I'm an accredited mediator through CEDA, and I have experience of practice as a mediator, as a representative in mediation, and a party. And 20 years ago, I established a commercial mediation company which deals with thousands of cases each year throughout the United Kingdom. So that's a quick plug for global mediation, www.globalmediation.co.uk. Um, a couple of notes, as Ian said at the beginning, for those who have just joined, there is a poll to complete to indicate to us your prior involvement in mediation, and we'll try and share the results. And there's also, if you look to the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Uh, please do field questions to us, don't be shy and we will do our best to answer as many as possible. Um, there are also practice notes and the presentation video, which will be distributed at the end, so that saves you trying to scribble down notes. That resource is also available via the Goldsmith Chambers website. So Ian will start us off with some background and context, and I will be picking up with some practical considerations. Over to you, Ian. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so, of course, everyone here will be familiar with the British justice system, and in particular, any civil litigators will be very well familiar with the dispute resolution mechanism that is created by the British justice system itself. Of course, everyone will be very well aware of just how popular the British justice system is. Lots of other countries, including America, most of the Commonwealth countries, taken the British justice system model, tweaked it and changed it slightly into their own system. But they all have this foundation within this one model. Now, of course, that's incredibly good as far as the British justice system is concerned, because it shows just how popular it is, how well it works as a system. And it's as a result of everyone knowing what the system is and relying on it that we've seen the British justice system become the first port of call for all forms of dispute resolution mechanism, uh, dispute resolution within the United Kingdom. The question we therefore have to ask ourselves is, well, is this still the case? Just because the British justice system has had a strong history, well, what's the current situation and what's going to happen going forward? On the slide there, you will see the changes that were brought in by the civil procedure rules in 1998, and in particular, the court powers that they have to encourage parties to use alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. So we'll all be familiar with Civil Procedure Rule 1.3, which creates the duty on the parties to meet the overriding objective and support the court in reaching that overriding objective for justice to be done justly and at a proportionate cost. Of course, the easiest way for the court system to uh, resolve disputes proportionately and quickly is if the court system itself isn't involved in the dispute resolution in any way. The court has additional case management powers in order to encourage the parties to use or consider alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. On the slide there, you can see CPR 26.4, which allows the court the power to introduce a stay of one month if both parties agree, and that stay can then be extended by the court. CPR 26.4a uh, outlines that certain small claims will automatically be recommended for use of the mediation telephone service within the court system. On the other hand, the courts also have the power, um, instead of the carrot approach of allowing space, the stick approach of cost sanctions. 
And in particular, CPR 44.2 grants the courts the power to impose cost sanctions. In particular, if a party has unreasonably refused to engage with alternative dispute resolution. Now, I'm not going to go too far into that uh, for the purposes of this webinar, but please do review the practice note, which will be uploaded after this webinar, for a further discussion about what is deemed to be reasonable and unreasonable. Now, it's not just the civil procedure rules which the court use in order to encourage the parties to partake in alternative dispute resolution. You can see at the bottom of the slide there a quote which has been taken from the pre-action protocol for judicial review. And the quote says the court take the view that litigation should be a last resort and that the parties should engage with and consider alternative dispute resolution methods. So as this cartoon on the slide indicates, we're now at the stage where litigation has moved from being the first port of call to being a port of call that should be considered of after all of the other dispute resolution methods have been uh, considered. You find with litigation that parties can fall down a black hole of increasing cost, increasing time, and complexities of a litigation system which has developed over a substantial period of time when other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms may well deal with a case faster. This cartoon which is on the slide is particularly good because it shows that there are many other avenues that parties can go down before reaching that black hole of litigation. So we have to move on to ask ourselves exactly what is alternative dispute resolution. Now the problem that we ultimately have is that there isn't a direct definition as to what alternative dispute resolution is. The quote which appears on the slide there has been taken from the glossary of civil procedure rules. And it just simply states that ADR is a collective description of methods of resolving disputes other than through the normal trial process. So it's effectively any other way of resolving a dispute which doesn't require the input of the court directly. Usually you find those ADR mechanisms fall into two broad categories. The first is binding ADR methods. That means that when parties enter into a binding ADR method, it acts very similar to a court. The decision which has been reached through that ADR method mechanism is final and the parties will be able to enforce whatever the uh, settlement is which is reached through that binding agreement. You then have non-binding ADR mechanisms. That means that when you enter into the ADR mechanism, if it ultimately fails, the parties can then continue with litigation, uh, obtain an order from the court and then enforce it that way. So what ultimately are the different ADR mechanisms that there are? Well, the first is mediation, and we're going to be hearing from Adam shortly in much more detail about exactly what mediation entails. Negotiation is an ADR method that most instructing solicitors will have engaged in prior to a case reaching the stage of litigation. And that's where the parties try to reach an agreement on a settlement without any input from a third party. The third option is arbitration. Now these run very similar to a court. Both parties will present their arguments to an arbitrator and the arbitrator will reach a binding decision that both parties agree to be bound by. If you think of programs like Judge Judy and Judge Rinder, those are actually arbitrations. The people on those programs would have contractually agreed to be bound by the decision which has been reached by the judge or uh, in, as it actually is, arbitrator. You then have concili conciliation, which is a uh, extended form of mediation, where the mediator will facilitate the two parties in reaching a direct agreement. Usually conciliation is used uh, particularly within the employment sphere and within the family law sphere. You then have an executive tribunal. Now that's very similar to arbitration where uh, someone decides the case for both parties. Instead, an executive tribunal will be made up of a panel. Usually that panel is made up by representative of both parties and a single neutral chairperson who will then make the uh, determination. You have early neutral evaluation. This is where somebody is asked to uh, view both sides' arguments and provide their opinion as to who is most likely to win the claim. 
it's very similar to approaching counsel for an advice but instead of it only being one side uh, providing their instruction to counsel both sides are able to put forward their best arguments and the uh, evaluator will then give their opinion as to who is more likely to succeed at trial and what the outcome of that trial is likely to be. You then have expert determination. Usually this is on a single issue where both parties will put forward their arguments to a sole expert and the expert will rely on their expertise to provide an opinion to both parties uh, on uh, the decision for that sole particular issue. Now that is non-binding, so if one of the parties was to disagree with the expert, they could then continue through the litigation. You then have adjudication. Uh, which deals with disputes as and when they arise throughout a set of proceedings. Usually this is used in something like construction, where there's likely to be ongoing disputes throughout the project which need to be resolved prior to a uh, final resolution. You have dispute review boards, uh, which are very similar uh, ultimately to adjudications, but instead of it being a sole adjudicator, it's usually a panel that would determine individual issues as and when they arise. You have mediation arbitration, or MEDARB for short. This is where the mediator will first facilitate the discussion between the two parties, acting with a mediator's hat on but there will be a time limit to that mediation. And if at the end of the mediation, the mediator uh, parties haven't been able to reach uh, a conclusion, the mediator will change their hat and become an arbitrator and will reach a binding decision. You then have ombudsmen. Now these are usually for when complaints are raised against either a public or private organization. Um, usually, Ombudsman will only get involved if the internal complaint procedure for these organisations breaks down and they will then act as the umpire between the organisation and the person who is raising the complaint. So now we've seen the different mechanisms, let's consider how ADR would actually work in practice. Now a situation which many people at the moment will unfortunately be familiar with is children being at home, not being able to go to school, and arguments will naturally arise within a household. Now in this scenario, we're going to consider that our uh, two children are particularly healthy, and the item that they're arguing about in this case is an orange. Now the mother has to resolve this dispute between the two children. Both children want to use the orange for a particular purpose. Now if the mother was acting in the role of a judge, both children would be able to make their arguments to the mother as to who should get the orange, but the mother will ultimately decide whether one party or the other party gets the entire orange. Now, as you can see on the screen, that unfortunately means that one party is going to be incredibly happy because they've got the entire orange, whereas the other party is going to be very unhappy because the decision would have gone against them and they would ultimately end up with nothing. We then move on to if the mother was acting as a negotiator. Well, naturally, if you have a single orange, the starting point for a negotiation may well be, well, we'll cut the orange in half and each of you can have a half. Now, if the mother was an arbitrator, the mother then may hear um, arguments put forward from both sides as to who should end up with which half of the orange. The problem is, in this scenario, both children want the entire orange, so neither of them are going to be particularly happy if they end up with only half of an orange. However, let's now consider if the mother is instead a trained mediator. Well, the mother naturally would have appreciated that by now both children are stressed, angry, hungry, thirsty, and ultimately at their wit's end as a result of this ongoing argument over an orange. So what she decides to do is separate children, puts one of them in the living room, keeps one of them in the kitchen, and speaks to each child individually about exactly why it is that they want this orange in the first place. While speaking to child one, child one says, well, I'm incredibly thirsty, we've had lovely hot weather outside today, so I just wanted to make a lovely glass of orange juice. She goes into the kitchen and speaks to the second child, and the second child says, well, I've been running around all morning and I'm really hungry now, so I was just intending to use the orange to make some marmalade. So the mother, being the wise mediator that she is, suggests that the two parties come together, 
and re they re are able to reach a facilitated agreement where they squeeze every drop of juice out of the orange so that the first child can have a nice glass of orange juice. And then the second child is able to remove all of the peel from the orange and turn it into tasty marmalade. So hopefully, through my explanation, it's become a bit more clear that litigation is no longer the first choice. Indeed, we're now at the stage where litigation is being encouraged to be the absolute final last resort for parties. Therefore, litigation isn't going to be at the forefront of everybody's mind, and ADR and the other dispute resolution mechanisms should instead now be replacing litigation as the solicitors go to first consideration. It's very tempting for solicitors to just pay lip service to alternative dispute resolution and instead head straight down the path of litigation. However, ultimately we can't urge enough that that is now the completely wrong approach to go down. Now, as most civil litigators will usually come across ADR in the form of mediation, uh, I'll now pass you over to Adam, who's going to go through in much more detail the process and practice of a mediation. Thank you very much, Ian. Very good um, explanation of all the different overview of types of, of ADR, and as Ian says, the most popular is mediation, and I think if you've got a happy client, um, that is uh, a very valuable um, we know how long litigation can take. We'll come on to advantages and disadvantages. So there is a working example on the left of the screen of a definition of mediation. A couple of things to highlight. It's voluntary. You can choose to come or not and can walk away at any time. As litigators uh, will understand, the uh, name of the game in, in litigation is to appear as reasonable as you can. And it's very important if you make an offer and somebody declines a reasonable offer of mediation, that um, can be quite a valuable tool. It's non-binding unless, of course, a settlement is reached. It's confidential. I'm going to say a bit more about that, uh, about the protections in place. And using an independent and neutral third party, the mediator, is a key to effective um, resolution because a large factor, in fact, is the ability of the mediator to put forward proposals which neither side wish to associate themselves with and a lot is to do with saving face. As the cartoon suggests, perspectives can be really important. You cannot go into a mediation with a set script. It is dynamic and transformative and emotions play a key part in um, trying to help understand the differing uh, perspectives. It's not just legal issues and we can't emphasize enough that actually these sorts of factors um, are uh, things that are played out in uh, a mediation scenario. I was observing a personal injury case in Florida and the claimant's counsel suggested at the forthcoming civil jury trial, which they have there, um, that an image of a gory knee injury of his elderly client would be blown up in big, in full technical colour uh, glory in front of the jury. And um, that sort of thing can, can operate that sort of grandstanding or emotional um, pressure. It's a mistake in my view to be grandstanding in mediation, but it is important to understand that emotions and commercial interests are an even bigger factor than during the usual litigation process. Um, mediation does provide creative uh, future looking options, unlike uh, many court cases. So the key take home here is avoid storming out of a meeting too early just because there's uh, some uh, digging in of heels. There's usually in my experience, a critical breakthrough just after the point when everyone thinks that everything looks hopeless. Um, I'm going to take a look at the psychology of mediation using a, a PIN model here, and thank you, Ian. Um, this is what uh, mediators will understand really goes on in terms of the psychology when you are negotiating in a mediation context. If you look at the top line, um, that dotted line uh, that's marked surface could be uh, a sea or um, a, a, an iceberg below the surface, but each triangle represents one of the parties. The position, which is the top triangles, is what we say we want, and that's the uh, outside view of what you tell the other person is your bottom line, probably. You'll see that there's a small area and the tips are wide apart, and that's usually how mediations start. Below the surface, in a way that's not normally disclosed to the other side, are interests, what we really want, 
uh, and you'll see that they begin to overlap. There's usually a commonality of interest, although nobody wants to be the one to tell the other side uh, what their interests really are. And below that is the needs, what we must have. And that's where the area of biggest overlap, and that's, and I'm grateful for Ian's cursor moving around there, you'll see that gray triangle in the middle is the area in which mediation uh, really works. Um, and consider this, if both sides remain at the table, there's a very good chance of a settlement, but parties do not normally reveal to anyone else what their needs are. So the key thing here really is to uh, not leave too early and to uh, stick it out because there's usually an area of good overlap. I'm going to turn to some advantages and disadvantages. Um, clients, um, and we'll just put those up now, we can, you can um, read through them. The advantages obviously are cost time, um, maintaining positive relationships, confidentiality I missed out, flexibility and control. One what I want to touch on actually is client involvement. It's a, a much um, more important um, outcome in, in, in mediation uh, or a much, much more significant event in mediation that the client is there and litigators have to manage that client. Traditionally, lawyers don't want clients to speak and depending on your client, you may be missing a trick because that can be a very powerful tool in uh, mediation. Increased settlement chances, uh, the benefits um, without uh, settlements of potentially uh, framing and narrowing the disputes. Um, disadvantages are, of course, if you've got uh, statutory or limitation issues um, where there are um, injunctions and so on, that could be uh, not so suitable. Uh, showing your case, people often are, are, are worried about, rarely actually arises um, if you're properly represented um, and risks of delay to trial, increased scrutiny of your client. Of course, you might want to hide away your client. Um, the success rates are slightly misleading because although most companies like mine say there's an 80 or 90 percent of uh, cases are, are, are resolved, that's the cases that actually get to the table. Um, and of course, the need to act in good faith. Although I would say that um, just because the other side appears to be unreasonable or um, not really following the rules, I wouldn't necessarily discount um, mediation. So um, what are the protections? Um, there are without prejudice rules of the mediation itself. You've also got the fact that it's operating within uh, legal privilege as between the uh, uh, client and the individual uh, and the mediator, and also confidentiality clauses that uh, pertain to the mediation. So there are considerable protections and there is confidentiality both in relation to what's discussed at the mediation by everybody, but also what's discussed as in between uh, one party and the mediator. And I will leave you to read um, some more background, which is in the practice notes in terms of confidentiality. So a bird's eye view um, is what the mediator gets. Um, the mediator can time offers and suggestions that can come from them and testing offers can be done without prejudice. Moving to top uh, tips, I'll just say this before we go through them, it can be a test of stamina. So come prepared with lots of snacks and activities uh, with your client. It's not like court where everything's happening all the time. Um, there can be some, some serious uh, periods of downtime. First of all, select a good mediator or mediation service provider, and we could probably help with that. Um, two, know your case. Um, very important because it's not just the legal merits of the case, of course, it's the emotional side um, that, uh, um, that, that, that is at play. Prepare a short case summary. That can be in two ways. That can be confidential just for the mediator, or you can have an open one that's shared with all parties. Four, make a list of the strengths and weaknesses of your case, and that is, uh, and that of your opponent. Uh, five, uh, determining who should attend is really important. Make sure that everyone who's coming on the other side has authority to settle and uh, consider whether you need counsel on your side or whether you want to go it alone. Um, there are real merits to having counsel who really understands how the mediation process works to present the case powerfully. Um, six, prepare an opening statement um, and decide who should give that. In my view, don't just go for the automatic default position, you know, hide, the client hides behind the lawyer. Think of whether your client can speak to some or all of it. And lastly, consider the points of agreement and disagreement throughout. So finally, representing a party is a skill to add to the litigator's toolkit. Um, we're going to uh, look, I think, Ian, 
on the effects of COVID-19 and answer a few questions in the few minutes that we've got. Mm. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone you do have the uh, ability to ask questions and I see that we've already got a couple that have uh, pinged through to us. Please use the Q&A box which should be appearing at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to get through as many of those questions as we can. Before we move on to the uh, questions, Adam, as a director of a mediation service provider, how have you found uh, COVID-19 and the effects of it? And have you actually found that there's a real impact on your business as a result? Well, I put up there on the slide, there is actually, it, clearly it's affected us all and a lot is being done um, online and that's the only way things are happening at the moment but interestingly it's quite a humbling process to be invited as we probably are into most of your homes and it's brought people down to earth and I think there's an increased cooperation and willingness to resolve uh, disagreement and um, that sort of door of the court moment is being brought to bear earlier so there's an increased use in video or telephone mediation considerations abound in relation to making sure that both sides are equally represented you know you want both sides really on video not one side audio and one side video but i think it's been quite positive although the numbers have gone down in terms of cases they're building up again and people are finding actually the online um, video mediations uh, very helpful and, uh, and and a good tool hmm. and uh in terms of the future of ADR, now up on the slide there, I put that there was a report from the Civil Justice Working Group on Alternative Dispute Resolution back in December 2018, and they outlined 24 recommendations uh, for the court system to impose that would have the effect of encouraging parties even more to partake in other ADR mechanisms. Now, they made it very clear during the course of that report that they are not considering making alternative dispute resolution mechanisms mandatory. Um, so, Adam, how do you see the future of mediation and other forms of ADR? Well, I think the voluntary aspect of mediation um, is, is going well. I think that there will be an increase in disputes and litigators should be aware and brace themselves for whatever time you've been enjoying the sunshine. I think when things get really going, um, there is all the uh, uh, warning signs that we're going to be dealing with a lot of litigation and a lot of disputes. And I think the only way of dealing with that really is um, by being good at resolving cases, closing those cases to the satisfaction of all parties, rather than the traditional sort of racking up um, long term litigation. Um, we, were, we were asked a question here, do we find that sometimes defendants come into the mediation without an interest to settle, but more to test the evidence? I would say that that's a fear that's definitely expressed, but not so much in practice, because um, a lot of the time, in fact, you've got the protection of the mediator. So even if um, you want to have uh, private sessions and have shuttle diplomacy, even if you come into a room, um, you still can, as a good litigator, um, control uh, what is said. For instance, I wouldn't necessarily um, allow question, you know, your client to be uh, cross-examined from across the table. Uh, there might be questions. And being a flexible process, you can always break and say, actually, um, we want to have a discussion and we'll come back and answer that. So I don't think there's the same exposure as people fear. Um, where do you see the advantage of mediation over JSM? Um, so the, a, a technical question there. Um, I think mediation is... A, um, it is a, a flexible um, process and um, it, it covers quite a wide array so really by negotiating with the mediator as to what you want and how you want to play it um, I, I think it's a very flexible um, mechanism. Um, lastly I think the quote um, Mark Twain is, is very pertinent if you do what you've always done you'll get what you always uh, got. Is that a fair summary Ian? <laughs> Oh, I definitely think it is, Adam. Um, as always with all of these webinars, if we haven't had the opportunity to get to your question, please do email in your questions to our two civil clerks, Ben Cresley and Alice Martin. They'd be very happy to hear from you. And indeed, if you have any further questions about the mediation process and procedure, or you'd like to speak to a barrister for representation through a mediation, please do get in contact with us and we would be more than happy to assist.
Now, just very brief reminder, as Adam mentioned right at the very beginning of this uh, webinar, uh, the practice note, the slides from today, and a copy of the video itself will be uploaded within 24 hours of this hearing. Now, it may take a bit of time, and it will definitely be coming out to you. So we have been asked to urge you, please don't email into Chambers uh, chasing those slides, as you will be receiving an email within 24 hours as soon as those slides have been uploaded. You can find the slides, the practice note, and a link to the video all in the news section on Chambers' website. Or, if you would like to, you can go to YouTube, type in Goldsmith Chambers, and you'll be able to find not only this webinar, but all of the other webinars which we've done. Now, if you'd like to be notified of upcoming webinars that we have, please go to the Eventbrite page, which is presumably how most of you have found this webinar, or if you subscribe to the Goldsmith Chambers YouTube page, you will be notified any time in which one of our new videos is uploaded. Now, I am very pleased to announce that due to the overwhelming popularity of this webinar series, it has been agreed that this webinar series will be uh, extended. And further than that, the crime team will now be giving webinars as well. Now, the first crime team webinar will be on Friday the 5th of June, and it will be led by Marie de Redman and Hannah Gladwell, and they'll be talking about police station interviews and adverse inferences during the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, if you've loved hearing Adam's silky and lovely voice, he will be giving a webinar on Friday the 12th of June, along with our Head of Chambers, Anthony Metzacusi, and that will be about private prosecutions. The next webinar that we have in this series will be tomorrow at 3 o'clock, and that will be on varying financial orders from the family team, led by Dr Charlotte Proudman and Joanna Gillen. The next the next uh, civil team webinar that we'll be doing will be back here at three o'clock and that will be with uh, the head of the civil team, Heather Beckett, and she'll be leading you through clinical negligence in the uh, context of COVID-19. And if I could encourage you to do so, that will definitely be a brilliant webinar to check out. Thank you ever so much for giving us your time this afternoon and we look forward to seeing some of you again for the next webinar.